Good afternoon. This is Roger Hitchcock. Uh, welcome to our next Navigating the Blizzard webinar series. Uh, as some of you have joined us previously, thank you for that. And as you know, what we're trying to do in the series is really help you think strategically through the unfolding or emerging situation. And today we're going to focus quite specifically on risk governance and risk, risk mapping. Um, my name is Roger Hitchcock. I'm a senior partner at the Sadar Group. And what we do is we assist companies and boards to, or companies to formalize and establish boards, and we assist them to make the decisions they need to make in governing their, their companies. Um, as we start, let's just put out a couple of ground rules and um, the, the way forward. We're gonna spend about an hour together, just, or just under an hour together. Please use the Q&A box um, as you've got questions during the course of the, the webinar especially if there are, there are key elements that pop up. Please also use the chat box. I have had previously my computer do something strange and not um, share the screen. So please, if, you, if you're if battling, please put that in the chat box and I'll monitor those as we, as we go. Um, and then you will also get a link to the recording afterwards, which you are welcome to share with others because our view in this webinar series is to really get as much information and help as many people out as possible. Many of you know that um, our countries are locking down. I'm based in South Africa, and we are in the kind of just between phases. A, a lockdown was announced on Monday night and is coming into effect tomorrow evening. So a lot of us have really been trying to get our ducks in a row, getting you know, the necessary provisions, um, preparing, but also having difficult and tough conversations in our businesses. Um, and one of the key things we needed to think about is what are the implications? What actually lies ahead? And the danger of what we're going through is it is unprecedented. It is kind of unexpected. It's something that many of us haven't been through before. And so as Sadar, we believe that um, even though we're going through a blizzard and we haven't been through this kind of blizzard before, we can help you at least at the very least ask the right questions address and engage in the right kind of thinking. And that's what this webinar series is all about. The Navigating the Blizzard webinar series is about helping you determine the next steps to take in your business. I'm of the firm opinion that you have the answers if you really look hard enough. Um, but we do need to, to think through those. We need to think through the implications of those decisions we make, those steps we take. We need to think through the steps, the impact of those steps. What is the result gonna be? Um, and so the key thing we want to do today is unpack some of those elements. Last time we did unpack the, the impact on stakeholders, and I do suggest if you haven't already, revisit that. Um, that is the webinar that some of the, the screen isn't shared, but um, it helps you map out who is impacted. At the same time, we've got to ask ourselves, well, what are we actually facing between now and our destination? And then we also want to help companies take decisions in a responsible but effective way. The reality is, because this is an environment of unknowns, it's difficult to discern what we can and what we can't control. It's difficult to think through what we can do things about and what we can't. And part of today's discussion is to unpack that. But one of the most difficult things is going to be, one, well, put it this way, one of the most those decisions we need to make in a responsible but effective way and so we're going to talk about that in one of the one of the following webinars is how do we how do we think through a decision making process and ultimately we believe very strongly and that's why we've chosen the phrase navigating the blizzard is that this is a thing we need to get through and so you'll hear me say that quite a lot today in thinking about risk it's not just about thinking what are we in what are we facing but what does this look like on the on the other side and we're already starting to see suppositions and assumptions, but we all need to take a position to some degree on that. And looking through the blizzard is something that I'm going to emphasize today as well. Please also note at the bottom there, these are designed to be working webinars. The idea of that is I trust you have pen and paper available. I'm going to unpack obviously a few concepts in talking about risk and governing risk. And, but I'm also wanting to provide practical hands-on tools that you can use because as governors we can often think that our 
our, our role or our task is merely, merely to oversee these businesses and to leave the work up to management. But in a crisis, in the middle of a blizzard, it is the leaders who are the ones who actually have to get their hands dirty, um, dig through that snow, dig through that storm, um, find the way, um, keep a vision of the future or vision of the, the exit, the, the outcome in, in mind. And so those are the kind of tools that we're going to be, be thinking about. Those of you who know Sadar know that we work with a, a model called the Sadar Governance Enterprise Compass. Um, and I'm gonna use this to, to some degree, and we have used this to some degree in, in unpacking what we believe some of the biggest challenges are during this, during this time. And if I were to summarize where I think, and where we're trying to focus um, the, the webinars that we are busy with at the moment is we are, obviously we have, it's about decision-making and decision-making is one of the key leadership roles and so thinking about decision making and who makes decisions and we'll talk about that as i said in a future a future webinar um, early next week but also thinking about stakeholder engagement we spoke about that last time critical conversation we need to be having right now if we haven't already had it is who are we impacting and how and closely aligned with that is this concept of of risk management and risk governance and often when i talk through the governance compass is I, I emphasize that these three elements at the bottom here, um, sustainability being our impact, what do we leave behind? But these three key elements at the bottom, especially stakeholder engagement and risk management are things we need to get skilled at in our decision-making processes. And obviously the other critical one that we are gonna look at quite strongly is what, is, what do things look like? And I will, I will touch on some of the strategic elements um, today because a critical part of governing risk is having a clear eye on something in the future um, and I'll, I'll position that when when i get there we'll obviously be talking about some of the other areas but the primary you know focus areas that we're, that we're looking through or uh, looking to in in this webinar series we're starting here and unpacking it and that just gives you some context we're going to be looking obviously at risk but it's in the context and i may you know dive into some of the other areas as we as we go you know, we are in a, in a blizzard. A blizzard um, is both defined as a, a storm or, or a snowstorm. Now, for some of us, that's not that familiar, but I think the other definition of blizzard is one that I think is emerging more and more. A blizzard is when a whole lot of things happen at the same time. And what we're seeing in the world today is a whole lot of things happening at the same time. Um, it's ironic, in a sense, the, the moves in the, you know, the, the the one triggering the other but i think we're in a we're in a situation where a lot of things are triggering other things and we're not it's it's not that clear um and peter drucker one of the top management you know gurus of the you know second half of the 1900s and certainly into the early 2000s he said this and it's critical for us to understand how we address and how we face what's coming at us um and these first couple of slides are just about, again, positioning. It's important to position our thinking and say, well, where are we, where are we starting from? And the reason I start with, I always like to start with some positioning slides is because as a board, our view on the business is different from operations. Um, operations in the business are about um, often reacting, often acting quickly, often you know, responding. A governance perspective on the business is about anticipating. It's about pausing before we act. It's about asking ourselves the question, what is the outcome before we fully unpack and activate the, the decision? And so Peter Druckers in the light of that said that in, terms of, in times of turmoil, the danger lies not in the turmoil, but in facing it with yesterday's logic. Now I'm not denying at all the fact that what we're going through is, is absolutely immense. Um, and conversations I've had with a range of people over the last few days have been around, you know, we're fearful, we have, we have anxiety, we're really not sure what to anticipate. Um, and to speak hope, to speak, you know, uh, reason in today's world is, is, is often a difficult thing. But what we want to challenge and what we like to challenge in the boardroom is that the answers for tomorrow lie in tomorrow. They don't necessarily only lie in yesterday. And sure, we can learn from yesterday. We can look back, we can learn, we can, we can unpack what's happened. But right now, it's really, really important 
that we, we, we apply thinking together as a team. One of the other critical principles of leadership at board level is we're talking about a team of leaders and not just individual leaders. And yet in our organization, we've often relied a lot on the individuals. There is wisdom in, in, in group thinking that is healthy and productive. And so all of these tools that we want to unpack during these webinars, I encourage you to do them together. I've had some incredible, and we've had some incredible conversations as a, as a leadership team in Sadar just the last, the last couple of weeks. And a lot of the time we, we go into those conversations as individuals with a fairly you know, set um, opinion on where things should, should be. I've entered those conversations having thought through what I think is, is what it looks like. And in the conversation, I've been persuaded. There have been times I've stuck and I've held fast to my opinion. There are other times when I've um, I've said, well, that's someone else has got a better answer than me, and and we we need to look to others and to each other in this time as as well. And so the logic is not just individual; it's 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 the team. And so part of this skill set and some of the conversations we want to have is how do we think to, together as a team and not just as as individuals. Another powerful metaphor or framing for thinking comes from actually the. The root of the word governance, and many of you would, would have heard me say this, but critical to understanding governance is understanding what it is at its foundation. And the foundation of the word governance actually comes from a Greek word. And it's a powerful metaphor because the Greek word is the word Kubernetes. And it means, and the picture of governance in the word Kubernetes is to steer or pilot a ship. And I mentioned that because I'm going to use that quite a lot today when we think about risk management. Um, because we're not going to think so much about systems and processes and procedures. We're going to think about thinking. Um, is what does the captain of the ship have to think about all the time? And obviously this metaphor falls, you know, it falls down on the fact that I said it's a group of people and together the board is the captain of the ship. Metaphor we also use is the Sadar in the blizzard. The, the, the Sadar is the leader of a mountain, uh, of, a, of a group of mountaineers, of a group of Sherpas, but the team of the leader, the leaders is important. And so the, the governor in terms of the captain of the ship has to keep three critical things in mind at all times. And in a sense, there's an order of thinking that is going to structure our approach to thinking about risk. The first thing that the captain of the ship has to keep in mind at all times is the destination. Where are we actually headed? And in today's world, a lot of the challenges that we're gonna have is we have to examine whether the destination or what the destination looks like. And I encourage you to keep your current destination strong and only change it if absolutely necessary. And I'll touch on that going forward. Then looking from the destination to where we are now, we have to ask ourselves, well, what's out there? What's in the external environment? What are we facing? What does the route look like ahead? And the metaphor of the captain of the ship in a risk perspective is powerful because you know, going through, uh, you know, a lot on, on our course and we have been hit out of the blue um, by a major, major, major storm. And that's why the blizzard metaphor is, is, is powerful. Um, and so we have to ask the question, the captain of the ship in that situation would have to ask the question, well, how's that changed what I'm going through? So the size of the waves change, the size of the, the currents change, the winds change. What do I have to do to think about that? And the third context at the end of the day is the one about the internal environment. Um, and to think about how do we, how do we manage um, how do we manage our internal environment? How do we think about our, our internal environment? Um, I do see a message, a, con, a message about cutting out. Um, I'm going to the the recording should be should be fine online, and you can always, if you are cutting out, um, it may be something that you can go back to the recording. Thanks for putting that up there. Um, and so, one of the key things we need to do as the captain of the ship is to really really ask ourselves: Are we as a team of people, how united are we in the way that we see the destination, the way that we see the external environment, and the way that we understand the internal environment. And the internal environment is about what are we capable of? Are we, what is 
the ship able to do? What is it able to, um, to encounter? What is it able to address going through this time ahead? What's the strength of the ship? Maybe your ship is one that will weather the storm. Maybe your ship is one that, you know, parts are going to be strong, parts are not going to be strong in the months that lie ahead. Also critical, and, and we laid the foundation, again, just briefly, um, two key foundation stones that if we want to revisit the web, first webinar we did on thinking. Um, critical, and I'll revisit this because it emphasizes that, that this thing is a through thing. Our approach to navigating the blizzard is it's through. We are hopeful. Um, we are optimists. We are recognize the, the dangers, and we are going to do our very best to help and provide information to, to limit the damage going forward. But in liminal thinking, and liminality is the, is, liminal is the word for a threshold. Um, and so in a threshold, we transition from one space to the next. And so we have to ask ourselves, how do we approach this thing? So we have a shutdown coming, a lockdown coming in, in 24 or so hours here in South Africa. Some countries have already shut down. What is that? What does it look like? How are we going to prepare ourselves, our businesses for that? And I know many of you have been involved in, 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 in really, really high, high level meetings dealing with this. Um, how are we going to go through it? So what are we going to go through this time? In one sense, there'll be less to do. In other senses, there may be a lot more to do. Um, in one sense, we may keep things as they are and pause some things. In another sense, we've got brand new things. Possibly our people are working from home. Possibly people are you know, well, they will be distributed. Possibly we're having to manage, as many of you I know are, in your own households. There are, you know, people going to be stuck in the same house for the next the next three or four or six weeks, depending on how long this thing this thing lasts. Last. There are lots of through challenges we're going to we're going to have. Um, and then we need to ask ourselves and keep in mind what do things look like on the other side. And obviously that picture is going to emerge because the challenge of a blizzard is things do get foggy and they do get vague and they do get challenging um, but in terms of some of the some of the key criteria is going is going to really think about how are we clear in terms of the vision the way forward and what we are what we're looking at um, looking forward the other the other challenge is that we have to ask ourselves during this time um, and the other foundation stone that we laid in webinar one was this concept of requisite variety. And what requisite variety says is that at the end of the day, for, for the, the, the company to be able to handle the challenges thrown at it by the environment, um, it needs to handle, it needs to have within it at least the same variety as the as the environment and so some of our businesses they're going to be areas of the business that that may sound or may be a bit fragile that may be a bit, be a bit challenging but for the business to be governed well the governing body or the controlling body of governors needs to also have the requisite variety um, and that's a concept from from biology whereas a biological system that is successful has the ability to handle the variety, the challenges, the changes in the environment. And companies will survive through this if they find ways to, to manage the variety. And we manage the variety through the people we have around the table and the systems that we have in our, in our, in our businesses. And so what we're going to talk about is obviously what do some of those systems look like in terms of risk management and risk governance. And so if we get into risk and talking about talking about about risk. In South Africa, we have a, a code called the King 4 Code of, of Corporate Governance. Um, risk has, interestingly enough, been a primary focus or had its own principles and chapters from King 3. Um, and the principle, the 11th principle of King 4 is that the governing body should govern risk in a way that supports the organization in setting and achieving its strategic objectives. So one of the foundational concepts of risk is that Something is a risk because it affects our ability to achieve our strategic objective. And I'll come back to that because often what happens is we lose sight of that point and we start taking action, putting control systems in place, doing things that actually aren't as effective as we think they will be because actually we've misdiagnosed the risk. We've misdiagnosed the, the we don't have a clear enough view of the impact of that thing on our strategic objective. 
And, and an example I often use in terms of diagnosing properly, and this is what I encourage you to do in terms of thinking about risk, is it's important to diagnose properly. Five years ago now, I, I went through a, a health issue. And part of the problem with the health issue is that I ended up, you know, I actually ended up in the hospital. I ended up on life support after a couple of days. I'd started off in September, October of 2014, um, not feeling well, elevated heart rate. I went to a, a GP and I uh, had an ECG and my heart rate was 161 beats a minute. And uh, those of you who know heart rates is that's extreme. And so for a number of months, my heart was running at, a, at an elevated rate. Um, that caused my lungs to start a fill with fluid. And so by the middle of November, 2015, I'd gone through and I, I ended up in, um, in hospital. I went to hospital towards the end of November. And within a week, I ended up with heart failure, lung failure and kidney failure. But I wasn't, the, the cause of the problem wasn't my heart, my lungs or my kidneys, but the cause of the problem was I was undergoing something called a thyroid storm. And in a sense, that's a blizzard. They talk about um, a thyroid storm. It could be called a thyroid blizzard. And what, what that happens is that your entire body is flooded with thyroxin, which your thyroid normally controls, and all of your systems go out of, out of, out of kilter. And really, it's, it's, it's a crisis. And then your, your system starts to shut down. And, and we're, we're seeing that at the moment. Um, and so it was only when that was identified as the key underlying cause that action could be taken to start to fix my, my lungs. So my lungs started to fill with fluid and I was actually put on life support so that I could recover and so the cardiologist could figure out exactly what to do to do with me in that time. But often enough, we're going through one of those right now. Um, and so it's not just in achieving our strategic objectives, but it's also in setting them in our decision making going forward. So a critical part of risk is to diagnose um, properly. If we don't diagnose properly in the current environment, it's going to be a challenge. And so we have to ask ourselves, well, well then what, what then is risk? And how does that, how does, how do we address risk? And risk is an interesting word because it actually comes from, it comes from the Latin word, risque, which means to dare. And one of the key things that tells us is that often what happens is when we think about risk management, we think of the managing of risks as something we do after the fact. We make a decision, we act, and then we manage the risks. And that sequence is the wrong way around. What we need to be doing is making sure that the risk management is actually being done when we make the decisions. And so going forward, you are going to have to make huge decisions in how to handle this crisis and then how to how to how to respond and react to the to the environment and so it's not just about putting reactive systems in place it's actually about making better decisions um, another word in the risk space that that highlights that is the word hazard which comes from the arabic word al -Zair. and the picture of that is a dice and so i often say when i'm unpacking this with companies as well what do, what can you control in throwing a dice um, can you control the throw or can you control the fall? And the reality is, is you, can, you can't control the fall. The dice will fall where it falls based on your throw. Now, obviously, there's unknowns in that, and that's the point of throw, throwing a dice. But too often, we make our decisions in the hope that, in the assumption that. And so what we need to do in our decision making is we need to go back and find out how we can apply the tools of risk management to better decide, um, to decide better, to think better together. And so the thinking about risk has also shifted. So when we think about risk and the development of, of the approaches to risk, we often think of risk as a negative thing. Um, normally, when, when we think about risk, it's about avoiding something going wrong. It's about preventing something going wrong. And actually, sure, that's where it started. But, but where does that come from? And it comes from a variance from what we plan. And so the risk isn't so much in avoiding the bad, it's about the variance in the system or in the, in, from, from what we plan. And so the latest thinking about risk is actually that risk is in itself the effect of uncertainty on objectives, which means that the way we reduce risk is we reduce this thing called uncertainty. Again, it's understanding that the current environment is by default uncertain, but in that uncertain environment, we have to ask ourselves, what can we control? and what can't we control? 
what is certain and what is not certain. And so it's not just something that happens afterwards, but it's something, if it's the consequence of our decisions and actions, we, we manage risk by making sure that we make better decisions and that our actions are also well controlled. It's not just the aftermath we are, we are looking for. Um, and so when we think about governing risk um, and, and thinking about risk, is I want to take you through the balance of this, this, this hour together is think through some practical risk thinking. And risk management is not an academic exercise. I know there's a lot of academics around it and there's a lot of models and trying to avoid you know, addressing it, but you'll see some of those models and some of the concepts of the models coming through in, in, in what I unpack. But ultimately it must be kept practical at every level of the business. And that's another critical element is that in, in thinking about risk, every level of the business has to be able to think of, about risk. If risk is governed or managed in decision making, every single person in your business who is a decision maker should be able to manage and govern the risks that are party to that decision that they are making. Right through from the board, right through to the person who is your, your driver. Your driver is the risk manager of the, the daily routes. Um, your, that's part of the reason for this, this so lockdown is to essentially give everybody, we are getting the responsibility as individuals for controlling what we can control. In that if I get a virus and I can control, which I can do by isolating myself, the number of people that have a chance of getting it from me, it's giving me the ability to manage the risk of passing it on. If, I'm, if I don't want to get the, the virus, it's giving me the, the right, and this is is the challenge we have blanket blanket top-down um, you know instructions but actually what it's doing is it's pushing the ability to control the risk to the individual because the nature of what we're going through requires that um, and so each one of us have to not only make risk decisions in our business in the next few weeks and months but risk decisions in our our personal lives as well and so it's unpacking what i call parts of the risk management toolbox and i want to take you through a a, a key flow of of thinking that'll hope, hopefully help you identify. And as I said, this is where the pen and paper is important because hopefully as we go through this, you can actually start working out what areas to focus on in your, in your business going forward. It starts obviously with, with identifying the risk. And that's one of the challenges right now. The challenge in a blizzard of a lot of things happening suddenly at the same time is we can very easily be overwhelmed. And I know that a lot of us are, but the golden rule of risk management is that the risks must be tangible and specific. Apologies for the spelling mistake. The risks must be tangible and specific. We cannot govern risk at a category level. So similar to the, the golden rule of stakeholder engagement, with, where we fall into the same trap, is that we need to take the categories of risk that we have identified and unpack them as deeply and quickly and clearly as possible so that we end up with something that is tangible and something that is specific. Only then can we test it and do something about it. And so if we think about sources of risk, going back to the picture of the captain of the ship, the first thing we need to understand is that the sources of risk lie in our strategic view. And so many of you would have gone through a strategic process where you've identified two-year, five-year, 10-year, 10-year plans. By default, what happens in a blizzard is your horizon narrows. The danger is we allow the horizon to narrow to the immediate only. And so if we want to see through the blizzard, we need to bring and develop, think through multiple horizons, and then pick one. And the one that I would suggest you pick is probably 6, 12, 18, or 24 months. Those are the things I think we can start to describe. Now, obviously, depending on the nature of your business, depending on what sector you're in, you would want to pick one. But don't pick a one-month view or a two-month view. Pick at least a six-month, preferably a 12-month view to ask the question, while going into 2021, what do we think the world will look like? And especially based on that, what do we think our business will look like? You see, the worst kind of sight to lose at this time is foresight. And it's the biggest danger that we all face. The biggest risk is we start to just respond to 
what's immediate. And certainly, some of the things we're going to see a month, two months, three months into the, into the future, six months into the future may not be completely accurate. But what we want to do is we want to make sure that at least we have something that we can align our decision making with. Once we looked at the strategy and we want to be in the future and bringing it down to a you know, blizzard based time horizon, which by definition is a shorter term than, 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 than in the clear weather, we have to ask ourselves then, looking from the future to here where we are now, so what lies between us? What can we see? Now, some of that, remember, we've already seen. So if we've done a robust strategic thinking in the past, we should have already started to spot some of the things. And here I'm thinking of some of the fixed things. So captain of a ship has to be aware of, of, of islands and reefs and those kind of things. So there will be some things into your future that you've already identified, that you You've already so not everything is changing some things are changing um, so identify what you know if you can identify those things that'll help you to create and to keep steady a steady course going forward then we've got to ask our, ourselves the question well what can we assume about the next six to twelve months you know, so so certainly there's there's changes but given some of what we've seen in some other parts of the world and as it unfolds we may update it but we can start making assumptions about what we think our countries and our companies are going to go, go through. Um, and that obviously is dependent on your business. Identify those things. So write down the known, write down the assumed, and then identify the unknown. And I know that sounds like a contradiction, but it's only when we put clarity, remember what we're looking for is tangibility and, spe and specificness, is we need to be as specific as possible about what we know, what we assume, and what we don't know. Because then we can test all three of those things so we can keep asking the question is the un, is the known the same as what it was before and that again sounds strange but is the assumed if we know we're assuming certain things and we can identify the assumptions we can understand the, the link between those as well and then if we identify the unknown what that does is it helps us continue to scan the environment in the right places it helps us to identify well what are the sources of information that look like they are known. Um, so I found myself trying to scan as reasonably and rationally as possible. Um, I am a, I'm a reader, so I tend to read a lot. I, I process lots of articles and lots of, you know, some, you know, news channels, not, not so much news channels. I do use social media to channel. I use Twitter to channel who I think are the, the, the right people to listen to. And, and over the last two or three weeks, I've tried to find people who sound like they're the kind of people who should know what they're talking about. Um, and try to avoid the people that are, that are not that. Now, obviously, there's, there's subjectivity in that. But at the end of the day, if I, if I identify what I don't know, or we as a team in our business don't know, we can start looking for people who do. And that's one of the critical things is we need to rely on one, an one another. A phrase I've been using a lot is we are going to get through this together. We're not going to get through it on our own. And so that's, that's bringing down. So we've got the strategic risk in the future. We then looked at the ex external environment between there and here. And then we can look at our own internal environment and a very powerful tool that I use a lot and is very powerful, not just from a visioning the company, but also from a diagnosing the company is we can ask the question, well, where are the key focus areas? What are the biggest areas of risk in our business? Is it our relationship with our customers that needs to change or we need to build? Is it the channel that we are reaching our customers with? Many of you may have businesses that distribute through retail chains and now shopping malls have been closed down. Um, it's an opportunity to say, how do, we, how do we protect that, but how do we also create value possibly in a different, in a different way? And then on the backside of the value proposition. And so business model canvas is powerful because it does talk, talk to two dimensions. It talks to what is often referred to as the front side. So this is what's visible, what's out there. And then what happens in the back office is what we use to create our value proposition, which is the critical thing. Um, and obviously there could be risks, as I said, in relationships and channels, there could be risks in the current customer segment. So what is happening in your customer segments? What is the impact of this on them? And then does that affect our actual value proposition? Do we need to enhance it at this time? Do we need to build some, some short-term solutions? Do we need to revise and review our entire value proposition during this time? And then what are the risks that we're facing in what we do, our activities? 
in what we have, our resources or our assets, in our people. And this is going to be a big one because the, the way we engage with our own people and those parties that we partner with is going to be absolutely critical in continuing to add value, even if it changes to the customers that we, that we um, currently serve and deliver to. And so what we want to protect at the end of the day is we want to, we want to protect this flow. Okay. And some parts of this flow are going to be input parts. So which parts of the business are at risk when our, there's, there's, there's risks in the front end, it's the revenue streams, what's at risk in the back end, it's our cost structure. And we need to be rapidly examining and asking ourselves the question, where do those risks lie internally? And so if we, this is what we meant by, by sources, sources of risks. And when we, when we think about, um, you know, thinking about, about risk and the risk identification, what we're looking for here is we're looking to go from the, the broader categories to the specifics. And so under each of those risk areas or risk events that we think are going to happen, we need to dig down and ask the question, what are the intermediate events, the triggers, the root causes, the issues? In other words, to get to tangibility from a, a broader category of risk. So channel could be our category of risk where we think we've got a We've got a problem. We've got to get done and ask why, why, why. And there's a couple of tools to think through. Um, one of the tools or two of the tools that, that I often use, the one is called a bow tie and the other one is called a fishbone. And the reason I like these is because I'm a visual thinker, as you would have seen from my, my pictures. And so I try to think, think visually. And so if we've put what a bow tie looks like as follows, if we've put Chan in the, as, as, as the key area of risk, in our business, we can ask questions in two directions. So we can ask questions looking at the cause of why is channel a risk? What is the cause? It's because people are used to buying. So there's a there's a customer behavior you know, area. It could be that our, um, our channels are closing down. Um, it could be that you know, other people are, are going to shift, our competitors are going to move before us or something like that. And we can go back and we can ask the cause questions. We can then ask the questions in this direction, which look to identify the consequence. Right? What are the consequences of this happening? Well, we may be spending money on areas that are no longer effective. We may be locked, you know, locked into, you know, contracts. All right. We may, there, there are other consequences. And so the idea of this tool, and it becomes, it looks like a, ultimately it, it starts to look like a bow tie once one has expanded it out. And the principle behind this ultimately is that when we govern risk or manage risk, we either manage risk, there are three types of control systems. One control system acts early, all right? It acts on the cause and those are called predictive or anticipatory control systems. Those that act after the fact are called reactive or even remedial control systems. And those that act in the present are called detective. So they pick it up when it, when it happens. And so the whole idea is that we want to be spending time identifying the earliest possible action. And so these are the most important type of control mechanisms in our, in our businesses and for our businesses. The fishbone is similar, but it, it, it's quite objective orientated. So if this is our objective, and this is what we're aiming for, how fishbone works is it helps us identify what is moving us towards it and what is threatening us. So we have what are called accelerators and inhibitors. And again, the idea is to identify what's moving us in that direction and what's preventing us from moving forward. And again, the idea is to get as specific as possible. And so once we've identified risks, we can then start evaluating those risks in terms of our own businesses. And here again, one of the biggest challenges is that we ask the wrong questions and it's all about decision-making. And so often what we do when we look at those and, and we've, I've really tried to you know, lay the foundations for the, for the um, key thing about evaluation is that we've got to ask the right question. And the two dimensions of risk, so this down the, the left is our list of risks that have come out of our bow ties and, our, and there's lots of different tools. These are just two of them, our bow ties and our fish bones help us identify what those things are. We then need to ask two questions. 
The one question is, what is the actual impact of this thing, number one, on our ability to achieve our strategic objective? If we don't ask about our strategic objective, we will miss the boat because risk isn't something that is just merely out there. It is something that has an impact on our strategic objective. The second question we ask, and here we can rank things. So it's a good idea to get a, the, the right people together and brainstorm, well, what do you think that impact will be? I normally use a one to 10, one being low, 10 being high. Um, the second question we have to ask is, well, how likely is that? How likely is this thing to affect us achieving our strategic objective? All right. And then we may have a whole lot of other, you know, scoring. And so once we've got that scoring and once we've tested that, we can put that on a, on a risk map. And so in our, on our risk map, we have all of our different items. And once we've overlaid it, and remember, this is about decision making. What are we going to do about these risks? Where should we spend time? Where should we spend effort? Where should we actually invest our money, even in the short term, if it's for the next six to 12 months that we're looking um, and you would have all seen these tools, but often I find that they're not used practically because we, we merely build the risk register when we look at the map. Instead of asking the question, how does that impact our decision? Or how does that affect our decision making going forward? And also who does the work? Because a critical thing that governors need to answer is who is actually going to do the work? Who's accountable for, for acting on, on this? And so let's start on the, the low impact, low likelihood. Key here is that these are essentially risks that we've accepted. These are risks by definition, and if we've scored them properly, um, and if we've scored them properly, these are risks that are typically low, all right, on impact and low on likelihood. They're not going to impact us. They're not going to prevent us from achieving our strategic objective, and they're unlikely to prevent us from achieving our strategic objective. That's what we mean by the word accept. What we invest in here is monitoring systems. We're not trying to change the profile of this risk. We're not trying to reduce the impact. We're not trying to reduce the likelihood. We just simply want to make sure that it stays where it is. All right. So this is, we don't want to be spending money, especially in this time on any of these risks, because that would be diverting money and diluting the impact of our other risk management um, protocols and procedures. If we move up the likelihood, all right. So here are risks that when they happen, they're unlikely to prevent us from achieving our strategic. Now, the, the, the impact, sorry, of the risk will not prevent us from achieving our strategic objective. But because these things are highly likely, it's the likelihood. And because they're likely, the volume of those risks could prevent us from achieving our strategic objective. Um, you know, it, it's, it's the probability of it happening is higher. So the actual impact of the individual events is low, but the likelihood, because they happen and they're very likely, that's where the risk lies. So we don't want these things to happen very often. So these are ones that we need to actively manage. And the key principle of active management there is we want to reduce the likelihood of these things. We want to work on this dimension of likelihood. And so if we go back to the slide, the Botar slide, um, what we need to do here is we need to ask ourselves which of the key risk tools or treatments do we want? We want predictive tools because what predictive tools do for us is they help us to see things in advance. Um, and if we see things in advance, we can do something about it and we can reduce the likelihood of the thing happening because we can then take action. If the impact goes up, so both of those bottom ones are typically management roles in the business and so management should report to the board in terms of what are our monitoring systems what are our active management systems that are going to help us see these things in the future when the impact goes up but the likelihood is low and important here to to define a little bit what i mean by this line here that is the the, the line between the low impact and high impact and the definition of that line is that Below this line are things we can retain in the business. Above the line are things we need to get rid of. We need to move outside the business. And we do that in the third block there,
by transferring or sharing the risks. And you would have also seen one of the, both on the impact and the likelihood axis, the further down those axes the risk is, the more proactive we need to be. So the more preventative we need to be thinking. Something in the low, something right at the bottom here, we can have a remedial, um, a remedial um, you know, mechanism because we can, we can react. But what this means is that proactively we need to think about how do we ensure and how do we outsource. And those are the two tactics in transferring risks. And essentially what we're doing is we're getting rid of them. We're moving them to somebody else. And so that's why this level of, dis, this level of risk management is a decision-making level because those decisions have to be taken, they have to be given away if, if, if necessary, so that we can get rid of those risks. Now, the danger of both of those, just as a, as a caveat, is that when we insure and when we outsource, we are encumbering the business with a different type of risk. So what, risk, what insurance does is it converts tangible damage into a monetary amount and it's remedial. So we're still gonna have the tangible damage and often there's a mismatch because some things aren't that easy to put in a numerical amount on. Um, you know, in, in mining, you can have, if, if there's a fatality, the payment is never going to replace the person. Um, in outsourcing, what we're doing is we're transferring the risk of doing the work into a contractual risk that we have with someone who's gonna do, do the work for us, which means we need to still be able to manage contracts. And often this is where the challenge is. We outsource a lot of things, but we don't develop our own internal ability to manage contracts. And that's where the risk lies into the future. And then in the highest block, highest impact, highest likelihood. So these are things that when they happen are going to prevent you from achieving your strategic objective. And they are highly likely. So what do we do with those things? We avoid them at all costs. I often say that if, 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 if any, any company runs with too many things in this block, anything in this block, it's the, it's the block of stupidity. We, we, we can't afford to because these are things that will happen. And when they happen, they will prevent us from achieving our strategic objective. And so what do we need to do is we need to look at our objectives. Are our objectives still what they should be? Um, and remember the key dimensions, the captain of the ship, can choose a different destination, all right? So when you're flying in an aeroplane and an airport is you know, fogged up or there's a massive storm or a blizzard, the captain of the aircraft chooses another landing site. And, if, and for some of us, we may need to review whether we need to look at our, change our organizational objectives. Um, another way to deal with it though is to change the business model. And what I mean by that, and, and, and maybe to illustrate it, is to say, you know, if I'm, if I'm thinking of risk and I've said, well, there's a vision here or an objective here, all right, there is the present business model here and something has changed in the middle because risk is only what lies in the center here. And now there are things happening in the center that are, I mean we either have to, if something is in that block, the high impact, high life likelihood, we can either change our objective because we have to change our route or we can change the present which is our our business model um, and so for some of us we're going to have to really think through whether our businesses can continue as they were beforehand um, there's a little caveat because the challenge with some of those risks is they are things that we have to live with but if you were to say to me well this is something we can't do anything about what you're saying to me is by, by virtue of that phrase, you are moving that below the line. You're telling me ultimately that you're willing to continue operating with that risk in mind, which means it's not actually in that block. It's, in, it's a below the line risk. It's something that is accepted or actively managed in the, in the business. But you'll notice I put an asterisk there. Those things should be monitored very, very closely because in each of those things, we need to ask ourselves the question, how do we, how do we measure risk? And so, Lastly, once we've been through that whole, whole process, for each of the risks that we are thinking about, we can ask ourselves the question, um, so once we've got the accept list, the, the actively managed risk and the outsourcing risk or the transfer risk, each of those risks we can ask ourselves the question and the critical concepts in, in risk management is what's called risk appetite and risk tolerance. 
So the first thing to do is to ask, what does this risk look like from a measurement point of view? What is the measurable that we can monitor this thing with? And sometimes that's relatively easy because it's something like finance or something like activities. We can count the activities, we can count the money. Sometimes it's less easy or more difficult because it's perceptual. But ultimately, whatever that axis looks like, we are by definition saying that there's a certain level of risk we are willing to accept because that's our risk appetite, all right? Important as governors, we then need to ask, well, what level of movement, because things don't happen on a straight line in business, are we willing to accept? What, what, what range are we willing to accept up, up, over and above that key measure? And that's what's called our risk tolerance, all right? And remember, when we're thinking about this, we have to think about the future. So looking forward, into the next 12 months, into the next 18 months, maybe even to, to the next six months, what are we gonna monitor in the next term for each of these specific risk areas or risks that remember are tangible and specific so that we can monitor them going forward and take action if they start drifting outside of the tolerance levels. Um, See so what a control system does, a anticipatory or predictive, a remedial control system is it's designed to keep you well within your risk tolerance levels. And so there's obviously a lot more detail that can be unpacked, but I trust them what I've tried to cover is to say, well, what is the, what is the process of practical risk thinking? Um, remember we said it's not an academic exercise, it's a decision-making exercise. Um, it's about being practical at every level, every level of the business. And so if you've got questions, please, please pop them on the Q&A box as we, as we, as we wind down. Um, but to summarize, I wanna say, well, let's be optimists in one sense, but let's not be blind optimists. Let's be optimists who firstly, as captains of the ship, we are governing or we are captaining. Let's push and see as far ahead as possible. Certainly the blizzard, has restricted our ability to view things, but it hasn't turned our minds off. It hasn't turned our, turned our brains off. And so let's imagine, let's think through what we believe things could look like into the future. And that is something we will be looking at some tools of doing in the next, in the next um, couple of webinars. Um, once we've done that and we've determined our horizon, we've said, let's think about either a 12 month view, an 18 month view or a six month view. Once you've identified that, you've got to ask yourself the question, well, what are, what are we aiming for? Let's clarify that. Are we on the same page? And then what, are we, what lies in the environment between the future and the present? What are we facing from the point of view of the, the, the trends we think that are going to happen? What do we think is going to unfold? And how does that impact our business? And then what do we watch in the space to, to monitor what's, what's going on? Once we've got that picture in mind, we can start looking at our own businesses. So using tools like the business model canvas, or maybe you've got your own business model spelt out or visualized in a way that is really, really clear. Examine that, take it apart, ask the questions, where do the risks actually lie? What is, the, what is actually gonna happen? And remember the golden rule is you want to dig so that you're not dealing at a category level or a surface level, you found something that is tangible and something that you can actually act on and it's specific. And so there, using tools like the bow tie, asking cause and consequence questions, the fishbone, asking accelerator and inhibitor questions, also examining your underlying assumptions um, so that at the end of the day, we've got a clear view on what we know, what we assume, and what we don't know. And obviously that helps us clarify what actions we can take towards those. And then mapping those risks out. Once we've got to the level of practical application and practical tangible risks, we ask the question impact. So what is the impact of each of these things individually on our ability to achieve our strategic objective? And be honest and be, get enough people in the room who can get the right assessment of what impact is. Secondly, what is the likelihood of this thing affecting our ability to achieve our strategic objective. Because in today's world, with all the fake news going around, we can't react. We've got to anticipate and think ahead. Once we've done that, we can map our risks on a two-dimensional impact likelihood map. And then we can start saying, well, how does this help us make decisions around what things do we need to accept? And if we're accepting them, we need to monitor them. 
and make sure that they stay where they are. If we are managing the risks, we need to ask, well, what predictive anticipatory mechanisms can be put in place to anticipate these risks? If we are outsourcing or insuring risks, how do we engage in the contracting and the negotiations and make sure that we spell out clearly what is expected? And then what do we need to avoid? And if we get to the avoid block, we are then reviewing essentially what our objectives are and what our business model ultimately looks like. So with that in mind, I want to kind of wind down and, and as I said, if there are any last, last questions, um, please pop them on the Q&A box or the, the chat box. Um, thanks for some of, the, some of the comments that are coming through. I appreciate that. And please keep in touch with us. Please um, you know, keep in touch. I'll just quickly for the last couple of minutes put up the contact, the contact slide. Um, we have people on the ground in South Africa, in Ghana, and in Kenya. And even if you're dialing in from elsewhere, we're happy to take your emails. Um, we're here to help you. Um, and I'm sure that some of you will be able to help us. We don't have all the answers, but as Siddhars in the blizzard, we believe we can help you to ask some of the right questions and go through some of the right thinking processes. And so with that in mind, thank you very much for taking the time to, to join us. Um, please also share this, this link. Please complete the survey that will appear on your screen after this webinar is closed. Um, but please share these videos and hopefully we can all get, this, get through this together and let us know how it's going. We are very, very interested in terms of what people are doing and let's keep optimistic. Um, I'm hopeful. I know it's going to be tough. My household is preparing for lockdown um, as I'm sure many of yours are if you're not already under lockdown, but we can use technology. We can use the tools available for us to not be isolated. Thank you for your time and I trust you'll join us on the other webinars that we have coming up from Friday and they are Friday, they're Mondays, 8.30 SA time, Wednesdays, 4.30 SA time, Fridays, 7.30 SA time. For those of you outside our time zone, please register and you'll get the link to the videos afterwards. Have a good balance of the week and yeah, stay safe and stay sanitized. Signing off.